You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi had long said in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict that this is not an era of war. And today, after having endured the crippling geopolitical and economic fallouts of the fight, the world, especially many NATO countries, have become increasingly cognizant of the fact that PM Modi was spot on in his analysis of the situation. With the war seemingly heading a dead end, it is in the interest of all to refrain from creating rifts and participate in the process of procuring peace and prosperity for all. Join us as we take a closer look at India's efforts at securing peace and harmony and how it is the only country that stands a chance of resolving the Russia-Ukraine conflict. A lingering question that demands attention and answers is whether countries around the world are making enough of a coordinated and concerted effort to ensure the cessation of violence between Russia and Ukraine. With no ray of hope yet in sight, the rebuilding of damages accrued to date will easily exceed the trillion dollar mark. The world's leaders, however, need to be objective in their approach to the issue. Even if the war stopped today, Ukraine would require financial assistance of at least anywhere between 15 billion and 20 billion dollars just to make a fresh start. This figure will continue to rise with each passing day of war. Thousands have died in Ukraine, and the incessant bombardment of attacks have caused hundreds of thousands of others to flee their homes. Ukraine's average fall in real GDP was around 32%, while inflation was hovering around 27% in 2022, a vivid reflection of where the country is headed. On the other side, Russia, which has dominated some aspects of the war despite the West both covert and overt support for Ukraine, is experiencing negative trends in its economic indicators as well. Economic sanctions on Russia by many countries have squeezed the Russian market. The output of Russia's medium and high-tech industries has contracted sharply. The list of losses suffered by both sides in the conflict is staggering, and given the current circumstances, things are only going to get worse. Thousands of soldiers on both sides have died. Seven, eight million people have become refugees, which is a very major loss. So the loss goes into billions and billions of dollars on both sides. But the worst thing is that this war has created new areas of problem. And those problems are which are affecting the whole world. The question which arises at this point is why, barring a few exceptions, has nobody made any meaningful attempts to end the bloody war? Politics for power and not politics for people has ruled the discourse till date. Securing different types of competitive advantages has been one of the most despicable aspects of the war. It is this type of approach which has kept peace at bay. The weaponization of financial instruments, weaponization of energy, weaponization of food, weaponization of fertilizers, which is something that has never happened before. And that is taking its toll over the rest of the world. And most importantly, the biggest loss and the biggest impact of this war is indirect, and that is on the global south. So we, when we are counting the costs, you have to count the global costs of this war. Prime Minister Modi, one of the world's most popular and trusted leaders, has urged both countries to cease their campaigns on numerous occasions. Recently, while addressing a press conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Prime Minister Modi reiterated his stance and said that India was ready to play every possible role to restore peace in the region. Ukraine ke ghatnakram ke shuruaat se hi Bharat ne dialogue aur diplomacy ke madhyam se is vivaad ko suljhane par जोर दिया है भारत किसी भी शांति प्रक्रिया में योगदान देने के लिए तैयार है 
Modi's India is one of the few countries that has remained neutral and has maintained respectful relations with both sides in the conflict. Many have already said that the United Nations must take Indian help to deal with the war. Rightly so, as India is the only country that has earned the trust of all. While the G20's area of focus has been the global economy, a real solution to the Russia-Ukraine conflict is being anticipated from the group, as India is presiding over the chair this year. As the war wages on, more countries continue to adopt India's strategy one which is people and peace-centered. The Indian position for dialogue and diplomacy, which was initially critique, now stands vindicated. Moving on. Demonstrations have intensified in Sri Lanka as people are demanding the government to roll back its decision of imposing massive taxes across the spectrum. The government of Sri Lanka, in order to secure an IMF bailout program, has imposed severe taxes in the country. The global lender has appreciated Sri Lankan moves and said the measures being taken were in the larger interests of people of the island nation. Massive demonstrations were recently seen in Sri Lanka capital Colombo as trade unions across the country stepped up their protests against what they call the government's draconian policies to further marginalize the poor of the country. While as many as 2,000 people demonstrated at a port in the capital during their lunch break, most banks also observed a day-long off and parts of some hospitals were also closed as other union members also participated in the strike. Earlier, the protesters had observed a black week under which all protesting people wore black armbands and carried black flags and banners to several government buildings. Only a couple of weeks ago, the government of Sri Lanka had raised the electricity prices by 66% in line with the International Monetary Fund's demands to present a sustainable payback model before it granted any bailout package. Before this, the government had imposed severe income taxes ranging from 12.5% to 36%. We are not in a position that we can't pay tax. We, we are in a position we want to pay tax, but in a reasonable amount. This amount is not reasonable. That's why we are telling government should amend this tax policy. Otherwise, we will go for another strike or another uh, major action, maybe a continuous strike. IMF has backed Sri Lankan decisions that have been taken in line with international comparisons. The decisions were taken to help creditors regain confidence. Sri Lanka has been seeking a $2.9 billion bailout after it suffered from an unprecedented economic crisis. The economic crisis that spiraled into a political ring has also led to the resignation of previous president Gotabaya Rajpaksha. According to an IMF statement, the increases, which included an increase in income taxes of up to 36%, were necessary to address insufficient revenue collection by international standards. IMF, however, has also said that these steps would not bridge the gap completely to fund essential expenditure. Regarding the tax uh, imposements, Whereas those uh, tax imposments we think uh, as uh, highly unjust. So uh, regarding the matter, we have uh, launched many trade union actions, whereas uh, uh, one of the peak trade union actions are being, uh, uh, being done today, uh, that is a one-day token strike, whereas not only, not only the banks but the other, other trade unions are also involved. The island nation in South Asia is experiencing its biggest economic crisis since winning independence from the UK in 1948, plagued by high inflation, a lack of foreign currency, weakening currency and a severe recession. India, China and Japan have proven to be key allies that have supported the crisis hit country. Among these three too, Indian loans and assistance have proven to be the safest. 
Observers say while Chinese loans have strings attached, it is India that has been helping the nation in distress without any hidden agenda or objective. Moving on. India's massive economic leaps of late is not a secret. The world has not just acknowledged it, but is increasingly emulating the Indian model. Various economic bodies have said that India will continue to remain one of the fastest growing major economies in the years ahead too, with almost every sector projected to attain historic highs. Today in this episode, we will see how the numbers of the Indian retail sector are particularly staggering. The Indian retail industry has not just moved with the time, but is now among the best in the world in several aspects. With the economy successfully rebounding from the pandemic and its after effects, Indian consumers have hit the markets. From clothing to accessories, food to beverage, premium is the dominant word on the retail horizon. And both e-commerce and traditional retail players are vying for a piece of the pie. India is now the world's fifth largest destination for retail. The growth of the industry is driven by increased consumer demand, disposable income, efficient logistics, and advanced technology. Modern retailing has entered the retail market in India in the form of shopping centers, multiplex malls, and complex buildings that provide shopping, dining, and entertainment under one roof. Indian consumer purchasing power is on the rise, and retail sales in Indian malls are expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 29% from 2022 to 2028, to top 39 billion USD by financial year 2028. Increased footfall led to space expansion in India by domestic and international retailers, resulting in a 5% increase in leasing activity to 2.43 million square feet in July to December of 2022. Uh, many of them don't necessarily come every time to the store to buy the material. Uh, we have an app, uh, we do a delivery, they can see the quantities, they can see the prices, uh, they can track their orders. So we try and service them. So that portion is completely, uh, you know, driven by e-commerce or online. India's retail sector is set to experience a boom due to an unprecedented increase in domestic product consumption. The industry is on track to grow at a rate of 9% over 2019 to 2030, from 779 billion USD in 2019 to 1,407 billion USD by 2026. The industry is expected to cross 1.8 trillion USD by 2030. E-commerce has also gained significant traction in recent years. E-commerce has reduced the upfront cost of traditional stores, provided access to a larger clientele base, and has given wider space for visual merchandising through online publishing. The government's initiative Government e-Marketplace, GEM, has fulfilled 12.28 million orders worth 40.97 billion USD from 5.44 million recorded sellers and service providers. GEM started in 2016. Initially, there were some, uh, you know, hiccups, but it came out very, very well. And people have definitely helped a lot. You know, it's really, really streamlined. Streamlined the entire system for buying and selling for government. It's become more transparency. India's retail sector is experiencing increasingly larger investments as well, with 4.11 billion USD in foreign direct investment between April of 2000 to June of 2022. Recent large investments include Google expanding its cloud infrastructure in India, taking a 3.81 lakh square foot data center on lease in Mumbai, Flipkart opening a logistics arm for other e-commerce firms, and Keystone Realtors signing agreements to jointly develop a 1.5-acre plot in Mumbai's Mahim. The Indian retail industry has the potential to generate a huge number of jobs. As per a recent NASCOM report, Indian retail will add more than 25 million jobs by financial year 2030. With many milestones already achieved, and with many more in the near horizon, India looks forward to becoming the global retail hub, further propelling Brand India. 
Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. In what they call the day of disruption, people in Israel took to the streets of Tel Aviv to protest against the government's plan of overhauling the judiciary. In what looked like an unprecedented event, policemen saddled on horseback were seen confronting with the protesters. Protesters said the country was headed towards constitutional and social collapse. As per the accord, the Prime Minister of the country would now have the authority to pick judges and will also be able to limit the scope of the judiciary's authority, especially in cases where judges try to strike down legislation or rule against the executive. Following the formation of his coalition two months ago, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pledged to his allies that he would restructure the judiciary and solidify Israeli authority over the West Bank, where Palestinians seek to build an independent state. Netanyahu, who has been on trial for corruption, says the changes that his government has been trying to brought will restore balance between the branches of authority running the country. While he said this would attract more investment, many have said that this could harm Israel's reputation as a favorable investment destination. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the global body was steadfastly committed to the Iraq's democratic institutions. During his recent visit to Iraqi capital this week, Guterres said that United Nations would continue to promote initiatives that are aimed at benefiting all Iraqis. He also underlined that his visit was one of solidarity and optimism for the future of Iraq, unlike his previous visit when the Islamic State had taken over the large swaths of territory in the country. Guterres urged cooperation between the federal administration and the Kurdish regional authority. Japanese firm JCB is one of the most reliable credit card brands all over the world. The total number of people using these credit cards is 150 million and annual transaction volume goes to about 37 trillion yen. Starting as the first international payment brand based in Asia, the firm contributes in expanding the global payment industry. In India, JCB has issued 1 million rupee cards. Its market is expected to increase to 30 million in next years. JCB's strategy will help in accelerating commerce and contribute to the global economy in a number of different ways. Japanese firm ANA or All Nippon Airways is accelerating inbound tourism by promoting itself among foreign tourists. During winters last year, the firm collaborated with Kimono Mom, a popular YouTuber with a subscriber base of 1.4 million. Tokyo and Kyoto are two destinations in Japan which are visited by many visitors. Apart from scenic views, authentic food and beautiful culture, these places are a sight to watch in different seasons. Dogo Onsen in Shikoku is a famous hot spring resort. This town is attracting a large number of tourists. The culture of geisha has flourished in these hot spring resorts, which include traditional music, dance and games for the recreation of the visitors. As Japan is surrounded by the sea on all sides, seafood is a major part of Japanese culture. Fresh seafood from Seto Inland Sea is enjoyed on barbecue. Visitors interact with locals which make their travelling even better. Hokkaido is also a popular tourist place which attracts many tourists throughout the year. It becomes a snowy region in winters. Tourists enjoy beautiful winter scenery and skiing. It is crowded with foreigners visiting ski resorts in winter. Japanese hospitality is always good. Customer service is, is usually the best. Really, I, I love Japan. I, I used to backpack here every year. ANA has released tourist information along with influencer Kimono Mom through its website and official SNS. This is Kimono Mom, uh, a 
summer winter trip in Japan on ANA. ANA's inbound introduction has contributed greatly to tourism industry of Japan and is taking Japanese tourism to new heights. Moving on, the National Mission for Clean Ganga, a government of India undertaking, is successfully endeavouring to make the country's holiest river clean. Our show, South Asia Focus, showed you some three years ago how the work was being done on war footing to accomplish the mission of Clean River and today the change is there for everybody to see. From top authorities to the visitors, everybody is hailing the remarkable change that is essentially conserving the culture of the country. Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh is one of the oldest and spiritual cities of the world. It is said the city of Lord Shiva. Varanasi is the gateway to heavens. Situated on the banks of the holy river Ganga, it is the most sought after pilgrimage site for millions of Hindus living in India and abroad. Every day, lakhs of pilgrims and visitors come to the city to take a holy dip into the pious river Ganga. For them, it is one of the most sacred events of their lifetimes. Upholding this faith of millions in the holy waters of River Ganga, National Mission for Clean Ganga, NMCG, dutifully took up the onus of keeping it clean of solid waste, untreated sewage and other pollutants. Depending upon the, uh, the, the uh, uh, capacity, we had actually uh, diverted and alloc made allocations of the sewage distribution also on various, uh, various uh, STPs. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the old trunk uh, line, which was actually many of them, uh, the, the trunk sewer lines which were laid, they were all, many of them were choked and not functional properly, so that has been cleaned up. and. A leaving trunk uh, has been laid. So a uh, lot of sewage network uh, and uh, uh, cross allocation of the sewage uh, in various districts have been done to ensure that the STPs are functional. Now uh, uh, as of now, uh, th 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 there should not be any uh, outflow of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sewage directly onto the river anywhere. The newly constructed Namo Ghat by the government is witnessing a large tourist footfall these days. Sculpture of folded hands depicting greetings to the most pious river of the country has become the main tourist attraction. Apart from several Ganga cleanliness projects taken up by NMCG, a special emphasis is being laid on modernization and renovation of ghats along the river Ganga. NMCG has rehabilitated as many as 26 ghats in the city of Varanasi. The visitors seemed elated and satisfied with the efforts done by the NMCG in renovation and maintenance of ghats along the river Ganga. I think that the first time I have seen it, there नमो घाट तो बाद में निर्माण किया गया लेकिन बहुत अच्छा बना हुआ है साफ सफाई का भी विशेष ध्यान रखा गया है मेंटेनेंस चारों तरफ बढ़िया है बाकी घाटों का भी जीर्णोद्धार किया गया है क्योंकि पहले मैं आता था तो देखता था जब बाढ़ वगैरह पानी ज़्यादा ओवरफ्लो होता था तो घाटों की सफाई उतनी नहीं हो पाती थी लेकिन इस समय क्या है कि पानी जैसे ही नीचे आता है युद्धस्तर पे उसका काम होता है और साफ सफाई का विशेष ध्यान रखा जाता है द फेमस गंगा आरती ऑन द घाट्स ऑफ वाराणसी इज अ फेस्टिवल टू बी होल्ड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ टूरिस्ट एंड पिलग्रिम क्राउड द घाट्स टू विटनेस द सीन ऑफ एलिमिनेशन दिस ऑल्सो शो केसेज द फेथ एंड रेवरेंस द पीपल हैव फॉर द रिवर गंगा Keeping this faith alive, NMCG is instrumental in maintaining the sanctity of this city and the pureness of Ganga waters. 
The river holds great significance in daily lives of millions of people who live along its course. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.